So in this video, I'm just trying to survey a bunch of different strategies that different species other than us humans use to reproduce offspring. Uh, we no longer want you to read all of the particular details of how every group reproduces. So this is really intended to be a quick survey just to get you up to speed without worrying about all the details. So very quick survey, um, organisms reproduce in a variety of ways. Um, as it turns out, most organisms can reproduce both asexually and sexually. Um, so we're really kind of the exception in that regard as humans um, and many other animals that can only reproduce sexually. Um, very briefly, bacteria can only reproduce asexually, um, so they're not going to be able to generate genetic variety through reproduction, although as we'll see later, they have plenty of other mechanisms to generate variety to keep pace with evolution. So um, let's just do a quick survey of certain fungi, plants, and animals. And I just kind of, again, want to go quick here and just uh, talk about some basic concepts. Uh, fungi and many plants um, can, actually re can actually produce two different types of reproductive cells. And I just kind of want to quickly differentiate them, but we're not going to go through the life cycles that are in your textbook. So spores and gametes both lead to new offspring. They're reproductive cells. And I would say that the key difference between them is that spores always lead to new offspring all by themselves. Each spore will land somewhere, and if it's good for that species to grow there, it will lead to a new offspring. So spores always lead to new offspring without combining with each other. Gametes, like sperm and egg, typically need to combine together. Sperm fertilizes the egg, and then that resulting combination leads to a new offspring. And as it turns out, there's kind of an exception where in some cases unfertilized eggs can lead to new offspring, which I'll discuss in just a minute. But those eggs can also be fertilized with sperm, and so that's what makes them different from spores. Okay, so it turns out fungi and plants have different stages where some members of their species produce spores to produce the next generation and others produce gametes, but I'm not too worried about that. Okay, uh, let's talk about how plants reproduce both sexually and asexually. Um, obviously, to think about it at first, they can't move, which makes it very difficult to think about how they would get together for sexual reproduction. Um, not all plants, but most plants now are flowering plants, and so the flower is a reproductive structure, kind of enhances their ability to get sperm to egg because they attract animal pollinators um, who get fed, that's what they get out of the deal, and then the pollinators help carry the pollen, which contains sperm within it, to the next member of the species um, and drops it off so that then that sperm can get to the egg within the flower and sexual reproduction has occurred. So the flower is trying to promote sexual reproduction and then once that kind of pollination successfully occurs, typically the petals fall off and a part of the flower becomes a fruit. So all flowering plants who make flowers also make fruits. This is just an example of a jalapeno plant um, and the fruit basically is also, in many cases, a sugary fruit, or at least has food surrounding the seed whose purpose is to again attract maybe a different animal to eat it and the seeds, and then that way the offspring inside the seeds get far away from the original parent. Uh, is, I hope it makes sense that uh, offspring don't want to be right beneath the parent because then they might be you know, shaded or kind of harmed by the parent who is already grown. And so they're trying to get offspring far away, seed dispersal, and fruits just greatly aid in seed dispersal. So um, the other thing I want to make sure you're clear on is that the seed also has a food source inside of it. So that's the food source for the offspring inside. Please don't think of the sugary fruit as being a food source for the offspring. It's a food source for the animal that is incentivized to eat the fruit to carry the offspring somewhere else. Okay, um, but the other thing I want to emphasize briefly is that fruits are not always sugary. So we consider these biological fruits as well, like burrs that maybe get stuck on your pants or stuck on some uh, animal's fur as it walks by. So that's a way of hitching a ride on an animal rather than in the digestive system of an animal. Um, and then sometimes uh, fruits are kind of um, optimized to help carry seeds by wind, like these helicopter fruits. So all we define a fruit is in biology is just any system that helps carry a seed far away from the original parent plant, okay? 
So um, plants can also asexually reproduce. So we call this vegetative reproduction uh, because it involves a vegetative part, a root or a stem chunk. Uh, as it turns out, plants are very flexible. And so you separate enough of a, of a plant from the original plant it came from, and those fragments can regrow the root stems, leaves needed to become a whole new separate individual. And so that's vegetative because it doesn't involve a flower or a fruit part of a plant. That would be its sexual means of, of reproduction. Okay, so let's just finish with some quick example of animals just to show you that animals, some animal species can asexually re reproduce as well. This would be like a hydra doing budding. So just budding is typically making like a clone of yourself that's smaller than you at first until it maybe pops off and then it eventually grows into adult size. So here's a hydra reproducing by budding. Um, honeybees are an interesting example of a type of asexual reproduction called parthenogenesis. Parthenogenesis is just the idea that sometimes females can lay eggs that actually grow into new offspring without being fertilized. So in honeybees, um, the unfertilized eggs are male drones and the eggs that get fertilized would be uh, lead to new female honeybees. Um, that's kind of an interesting example of asexual reproduction because the eggs are still produced by meiosis. So it does actually generate some genetic variety, but we consider it asexual because sperm is not coming together with egg um, like in sexual reproduction. And then finally, um, another adaptation that animals have to increase their odds of, uh, of sexually reproducing successfully in some species is hermaphroditism, so being hermaphrodites, and all that means is that an individual has both male and female sex organs, um, so that when they, whenever they encounter a member of their species, they can both uh, fertilize each other's eggs. And that might be really useful in slow moving species or even some species that don't move at all as adults, like sponges um, uh, are typically hermaphrodites. Okay, so all we did is just try to survey a few different strategies um, that fungi, plants, animals use to reproduce both asexually and sexually.